in the beginning was a small person inclined to mumble. In the beginning was the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the shape of the taste of the sound of an idea. In the beginning was story. It's January the 23rd, 2008, and I am in London. You will be familiar with London. Uh, the uh, West End's wonderful lights, colourful Cockney characters, entirely unreliable bankers. Thank you very much for saving us. <laughs> it's a huge casino where I come from. London, allegedly a 24-hour city, but it's 2 a.m., in the morning and London is closed. In the whole of Chinatown there is just me and this lady who is sitting in a doorway smoking heroin. Now because I believe that you can only survive London by pretending that you are in a novel by Dickens, I decide that I should greet her as if she were a perky urchin. Good morning, crack whore. Morning, lady. Which is the most sensible conversation that I have had in hours because earlier that evening I won a book prize and ever after journalists have been asking me, how do you feel? Because journalists are very emotional people. <laughs> they always want to know, how do you feel? Tell us, when your entire family was swept into that combine harvester and then their remaining blood-stained fragments were eaten by especially ugly dogs, how did you feel? I, I, I don't actually know how I feel, um, partly because I'm being distracted by the other question which they keep asking, which is, what are you going to do with the money, Al? And I have an overwhelming desire to just say, spend it on Pringles and sex. <laughs> Which isn't true at all. I have no intention of doing either of those things. But I have that idea going round and round in the back of my head over and over, repeating and repeating, which means that eventually I will believe it is true and probably say it on television. And meanwhile, why don't I feel anything? Yeah, I, I should be happy. I just won a prize. If I can't be happy for myself, well, I ought to be able to be happy for my words. It's my words have just won a prize. So then I'm beginning to wonder if something has gone wrong between me and the words. Is it now perhaps like a bad marriage? Do I lie there in the dark with my words side by side, not speaking? Maybe, possibly, because at that vital moment when we were making paragraphs, I have to not move. <laughs> My right buttock causes noises, I believe. <laughs> this is sometimes the case. Oh. So maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's not working. Maybe at some point, you know, I, I, I shouted out the name of another book so there is awkwardness between us. But then I think, well, okay, I will go back. I will go back and I will find out if there is something wrong. I will go back to the very beginning of me and words. What was, for example, my very first word? Which I know. My first word was no. It's a sign of a good Calvinist childhood. No. Everybody was saying it to me, but I was saying it back. No. I say no to your no. I am a very small but incredibly determined person. And when I grow up, I am going to say yes to everything. I am going to be a positive Scott. No. 
and, and quite possibly I'll end up saying yes to sort of weird stuff that I'll regret later. No. Um, on second thoughts, my second word will not be yes. My second word will in fact be up. True, my second word was up. Anybody I saw who was taller than me, which was everybody, I would just go to them and I would say, up. No. Up. Oh. <laughs> she said, sure. <laughs> no, I was a very frustrated child. Plus, because of being a novelist, I was also quite troubled. You have no idea how difficult it is being a four-year-old girl who wants to dress only in black. There is no kindergarten goth range. <laughs> Even in Scotland, I did check. Uh, to make myself a little bit more interesting, I, I, I tried affecting a limp. Oh, that's interesting. It means grown-ups look at you and they say, oh, she does terribly well for a little girl with a limp. And I can say, yes, I do. I'm incredibly brave. I also thought about uh, running away. It was an exciting and interesting thing to do. Um, but then I, I realized that I, I wasn't actually going to get very far uh, because of my incredibly bad limp. So I was stuck in Dundee. How do I describe Dundee to cosmopolitan and sophisticated Berliners? Um, think of a less exciting keel. Uh, I was born in Dundee, a little bit like being born in the mid to late 1750s, but without the fun of public executions and cholera. <laughs> Dundee, it's where Britain makes a great many of its children's comics, uh, the Beano and the Dandy and uh, Just 17 Teenage Romance magazine, and also a publication called The People's Friend. Which again is very difficult to explain to cosmopolitan, sophisticated Berliners. Uh, the, the average reader's letter in the People's Friend magazine would, would run thusly uh, Dear People's Friend, I have been knitting a husband since 1953. I now lack only one flesh tone ball of Sardar four ply knitting wool to complete his finishing touches. Perhaps your readers can assist. Yours, impatient of Brechen. It's terrible. It wasn't just Dundee, it was Dundee in the 1970s. Many of you are too young to remember the 1970s. In Britain, that meant incredibly bad trousers, awful haircuts, ridiculous ties, dreadful shirt collars. Petrol cues, industrial action, and on the television, Doctor Who had the Cybermen, and they could flatten the entire city centre with a flick of a switch. And as far as Dundee was concerned, we had a district council authority which had flattened the entire city centre. Uh, I wouldn't like to say what they used for legal reasons, but quite possibly friends and family members who worked in the construction and related industries. So I had many reasons for creating alternative realities. Eventually, I actually did dream of running away. I was going to run away to old London town, and I was going to become a perky urchin, and I was going to scamper up and down alleyways, because you need no qualifications for scampering, and I was going to steal real teeth from poor people in order to give them as false teeth to rich people. In about six months, that will once again in Britain be a proper job. Because I, I'd done research and I knew that in the past, medical appliances and prosthetics were made out of very peculiar things. Uh, George Washington, as you all know, wooden teeth, also with other people's teeth involved. Uh, Tycho Brahe, you will know, famous uh, astronomer, uh, he had a metal nose. In fact, they were very, very fond of making things out of metal. Metal ankles, metal elbows, metal ears, uh, metal feet. They would say to each other, how do you like your metal feet? I don't really like my metal feet, no. no they are heavy and clanky and metally. 
Well, what about your metal nose? It's a wonderful metal nose. We've put a little clapper inside, so when you shake your head, it also rings like a bell. <laughs> Two for one. No, I don't like my metal nose. It means that I cannot even shake my head in sad disgust because then I will sound like a cat toy. I knew your average oldie English conversation would have run thusly. Who, oh, Sirrah, wherefore liest thou in the streets like that on thy back? Well, uh, my toffee leg melted and then my glass walking stick snapped. I'm afraid I may lie here forever unless I receive assistance. Ah, sir, I cannot give you assistance because of my entire spinal column having been replaced with these strips of felt. Yes. Oh, I may just shout in a moment and take, take this off and not do it. Um, you know, it's nonsense. Obviously, it's nonsense. But where would we be without nonsense? We would be in Dundee. Yeah. And inside my head, I had all of my happy places. The imaginary past, one of my happy places. Narnia, Middle Earth, Gallifrey. And inside my head, it got bigger and happier and more beautiful because my mother taught me to read. She taught me to read before I went to school, which was a good thing. Except then I got to school and I worked out that nobody else could read yet. They'd just been wasting their time playing. So I pretended that I couldn't read either. And I also really genuinely couldn't add up. So I began to get very tense. And when I get tense, I tend to hunch. And obviously I, I already had, you know, the limp. And, and the whole black look that was working very well for me. Um, so, so basically, I spent the early years of my primary school education looking like a very tiny Richard III. <laughs> now is the playtime of my discontent. <laughs> Obviously, my, my parents wanted me to be uh, normal, but they were distracted by one of their words, uh, D-I-V-O-R-C-E which they got, uh, and that was a good thing because they didn't like each other. But it did mean that for a while I and my mother and I had to live in a residential caravan in our growth, which is a little bit like living in a big damp garden shed with a potentially fatal gas fire. And if you've never stood in a great big damp shed and stared out, inhaling just a little bit too much carbon monoxide, through the sleet, at an illuminated sign that reads Pleasure Land, you don't have a full understanding of the cruelty of words. Of course, I, I didn't understand words at all then, but I did know that I liked them. In fact, I strongly suspected that I loved them. For example, the BBC broadcast The Three Sisters. Amazingly. They would never do it now, but they did. They broadcast a performance of The Three Sisters, as you all know, sophisticated and cosmopolitan Berliners, played by Anton Pavlovich Chekhov, within which three sisters stare uh, for quite a lot of the time into the middle distance, saying, To Moscow. To Moscow. And yeah, part of you is sort of saying, oh, for goodness sake, just go to the railway station, tell the man, to Moscow. And you can have a family rail car reduction because, you, you know, your sisters. Um, but the other part of you does understand, too. You understand wanting to go to anywhere other than where you have to be and wanting to be anybody other than who you seem to have to be, and wanting to do anything other than what you seem to have to do. You do understand that word, two. And I got my two, I went to university, where I read theater studies and drama, 
not English. Because I'd worked out that I would very probably be safer saying other people's words rather than writing down my own, because I'd had an experience that lots of people have, which normally involves me running around the stage a lot, but I don't think I'm going to because it'll make noises. You know when you have like a story in your head and it's a very beautiful story. For example, there's a man and he's in a wardrobe and he's drinking tea and there are snakes from outer space. It's a really good story. And it's so good that you just, you're full of it. And the only thing that would make the story better would be if somehow there could be more of the story which would involve you taking it out of your head and putting it in somebody else's head too. Which is kind of the point of having a really beautiful story as you give it to somebody else. So you run around and you run around and you run around and you look and you find somebody and you tell them your story. And your story makes them happy. <laughs>